Okay, hello everyone. Um, are there questions about that final paper assignment or grading or anything like that? Okay, I guess not. Um, okay, so dialogues concerning natural religion. Um, it would have been good to assign part one instead of the syllabus says parts two through eight, but I guess I didn't because I thought it would be too long. Anyway, I, I'm going to quote some things from part one as I talk about this because that's where Hume actually sets up the dialogue, although the, it's true that the main argument starts with part two. Um, so, uh, and there's also a preface where Hume or his character Pamphilus discusses the reasons for writing dialogues, which is also interesting. But um, in any case, so yeah, here are the, the characters. Is the right thing to start with? I guess so, yeah. I'm going to describe the characters in the setup of the dialogue. So there are three main characters, Cleanthes, Philo, and Demia. Um, Demia, it looks like it might be a, oh yes, I am going to go over it now, yes. Um, Demia, it looks like it might be a, a female name, but it's, it's not. Demia is a man. All the characters are men. Oh, unsurprisingly. <laughs> uh, you can tell because Pamphilus sometimes refers to Demia as he. Um, so these are the three main characters. There's also the narrator, Pamphilus. Of course, there's only one L. So it's like, all right. Um, so you know, at the in that uh, preface, Pamphilus. The preface is called Pamphilus to Hermippus. Hermippus is some other person. We don't even know who that is. But Pamphilus is writing to Hermippus and saying, uh, "Hey, I, you know, you were interested in that dialogue between." Uh, that conversation that I told you about between uh, Cleanthes, Philo, and Demia. So um, I'm sending you this uh, letter where I've like trans, I mean, transcribed from memory the whole conversation. And he says, Pamphilus says, I was very young when this happened, so it was, you know, deeply impressed on my mind. This should not be. Um, so Pamphilus is a young man or not a child for sure. I'm not sure exactly how old he is. Um, and, uh, and he's kind of, uh, like Cleanthes is kind of his mentor or, uh, Cleanthes is a, was a close friend of Pamphilus's father. This is all set up in the in the preface and part one. That Cleanthes was a close friend of Pamphilus Pamphilus's father, and after Pamphilus's father died, Cleanthes has taken on the responsibility of educating Pamphilus. Um, so anyway, they're sitting in Cleanthes' study, and this topic of natural theology comes up. Um, and the, so Pamphilus is the one who's, who's saying everything, you know, how it says like, then it looked like Cleanthes was thinking X, Y, Z, or, you know, that's Pamphilus. Um, but he doesn't have any speaking lines. Um, and then, um, um, these three characters represent three different points of view. 
um, actually Pamphilus says that in the preface. So it's not like if you started with a preface, you wouldn't be left to guess what they represent. It's he, he describes them. He describes quote, the accurate philosophical turn of Cleanthes, the careless skepticism of Philo and the rigid inflexible orthodoxy of Demia. So Pamphilus obviously favors Cleanthes, not surprisingly, considering that Cleanthes is his mentor or whatever, right? So Pamphilus describes Cleanthes as accurate and philosophical, Philo as careless and skeptical, and Demia as inflexible and orthodox. Um, um, Leaving out that evaluation, we just have, um, you know, Philo is a skeptic. Demia is orthodox. And Cleanthes is, well, I mean, he's philosophical, but not a skeptic. Technically, although I think this term would be misleading, you could call him a dogmatist, right? It is philosophers who are not skeptics are, are, are dogmatics. Um, but uh, he's a, let's say he's a, like a positive philosopher. He's trying to develop a, a positive doctrine rather than just throw things into doubt. Um, so I'll say just to begin with that I think that it's really not clear that either Cleanthes or Philo speaks for Hume in this dialogue. It's um, Demia certainly doesn't speak for Hume, although I think, and I'll mention more about this in a moment, that even Demia, there may be more going on than meets the eye. But Philo and Cleanthes, I mean, each of them sometimes says things that sound like things that Hume himself writes in other places. Um, and I mean, remember also that in various places, like in the last part of the treatise that I was talking about last week, Hume himself you know, describes himself as going through different moods, like a skeptical mood um, versus, uh, I mean, then there's the mood of spleen and indolence. That doesn't seem to be represented here, but then there's a more sanguine mood where he goes back and tries to establish positive results despite his bad experience last time, right? So at least, you know, Broadly speaking, despite what Pamphilus says, it seems like uh, like these two characters maybe represent different sides of Hume or something like that. It's possible, anyway. Um, okay, so that's just like a general setup of who the characters are. Um, I guess I should... Well, I'll just, I'll say one more thing, although again, I'm going to complicate this in a moment. Philo and Cleanthes um, are both supposed to be pretty clever. Demia seems slower, right? Like, Demia seems kind of stupid. Um, okay, so... Um, those are the characters. Now, what are they talking about? Well, um, you know, so they're talking about natural theology, of course, but it doesn't necessarily follow that that's the only or even the main point of the book from Hume's point of view. Um, 
So there's there's two different levels I want to approach this on. And then, I mean, after that, I'm going to go into discussing more of the details of the arguments about natural theology. But, so first of all, um, there's this objection, and it's Demia who makes this objection. It's on page 26. Now the... Well, I guess actually, before I before I read the objection, I should say what's an objection to. So this is a point where Cleanthes has come up with this thought experiment. Um, uh, a lot of this book consists of weird imaginary scenarios and thought experiments. Cleanthes has come up with this thought experiment. He says, um, suppose. Uh, well, it says, first of all, suppose there were a natural universal language that everyone is born knowing how to speak and understand. I mean, I don't know if that's an important part of the example or not. I don't see why it is, but I doubt, I doubt Hume put it in there for no reason. But anyway, so the main part is that in this world where everyone speaks the same language, there also are plants that grow books. <laughs> and um, I don't know if you can see that that's a book. That's a book. All right. It's not really a book from the first one I drew. <laughs> um, so there are plants that grow books. And there are good books. You know, they're like literature and philosophy, and they have good arguments and beautiful poetry and whatever, and they just grow on trees. This is something that happens in Oz, actually. Uh, but, um, yeah, I doubt L. Frank Baum was thinking of him when he wrote that, but maybe, I don't know. Anyway, um, so there's trees and they grow books and the books are good books and you read the argument and you follow the argument and you're like, great argument. And Cleanthe says, and look, I mean, if that happened, wouldn't you conclude that those books, that, that there was some reason behind the original production of those plants? I guess, you know, so the way it goes now, it seems like maybe every species of plant grows a specific book and they just propagate themselves and it grows the same book over and over. Um, but wouldn't you conclude that to begin with, there must have been some being with reason that, you know, created these plants that grow these books. Um, and the argument, which is similar to Cleanthes' argument throughout, is similarly, the world, doesn't the world show great evidence of design? How can you possibly doubt that it was created by a being with reason? Um, and you have to remember that, although as, if I have time, I'll point out, Philo does make an argument that gets really close this is before Darwin's theory of evolution by variation and natural selection. So, uh, you know, I mean, it seemed to a lot of people, like Cleanthes, like an undeniable argument. You know, animals have parts that work together in this complicated way and they're adapted to each other and how could that have happened by accident it must be by design so so to me uh, um who although he represents orthodoxy so you might think he would think this is great he thinks this is bad because it's as has been developed, especially by Philo before this, um, the um, Cleanthes argument does not establish the existence of the kind of God that Demia is expecting. So anyway, so Demia is objecting to this argument, and here's the objection. Um,
Again, this is on page 26. I should have written down what part everything is in. It doesn't say at the top of the page here, does it? In case you have a different edition. Oh yeah, it does say. This is this is part three, page 26 in this edition. All right, so um, when I read a volume, I enter into the mind and intention of the author. I become him in a manner for the instant and have an immediate feeling and conception of those ideas which revolved in his imagination while employed in that composition. So this is a... Um, particular theory about what you do with a book. It's, I mean, it's Locke's theory, basically, right? The point of the book is that the author has written down certain words that stand for ideas in their mind, and the point of the book is to get you to revolve those same ideas in your mind. And you do that, to me, as saying, by sympathizing with the author, by saying, well, the author is a human being like me, speaks the same language as me. Um, in this example, everyone speaks the same language. Again, I don't know if that's important. But anyway, um, so uh, I can guess what ideas they must have been having in, when they produced these words. But then, so Demia continues, but so, so near approach we never surely can make to the deity. His ways are not our ways. Right, so the argument is that, um, now it's not clear exactly what Demia is saying about this hypothetical example, what we would conclude about those vegetable books. But what Demia is saying about the actual example of the world is that the world was clearly produced by, if it was produced by some being, it must be by some being completely different from us, much more powerful and knowledgeable. And in fact, Demia thinks there's an argument that is produced by a perfect, absolutely perfect being, so infinitely different from us. So, um, uh, so we can't read the world the way we could read a book because we can't guess what kind of ideas would be going on in the mind, so to speak, of an infinitely perfect being. Um, so... Um, right, so it's denying that, that Cleanthes' analogy between this book and the world as we find it is correct. Again, I'm not sure what Demia would say if these books actually grew. But, uh, uh, there is a book that Demia might have to worry about, namely the Bible. Ray, I mean, if the Demia is orthodox, then he presumably thinks the Bible was written by God, and yet he's just argued that we couldn't understand it if it were written by God. Um, now, that's interesting and probably something that Hume uh, uh, has in mind. <laughs> um, but there's another question here, which is... Um, whether Hume is endorsing this theory of how to read a book. Um, and uh, because, for example, it's not Barclay's theory necessarily of how to read a book. Re like, I think Barclay would have no problem explaining how we can understand the Bible because it's, you know, the main... Uh, function of language is not to represent ideas in the mind of the speaker. The main function of language is to have certain effects on the will of the listener. Um, so, uh, um, so it's not clear which side Hume is on there. And it's an important question because we're trying to understand Hume's book. <laughs> right? So, I think, um, you know, one of the things this book does is, um, and it's especially pressing because the dialogue form, 
where you know where he's deliberately chosen not to speak in his own voice he does add a footnote at the end which is probably the one thing in the book that you can be sure that Hume doesn't agree with <laughs> what the footnote is at the end but in any case um uh, um, Hume has deliberately decided to write a book where he's not taking direct res responsibility for anything that's in it. Why would you do that? Not necess not to ex allow other people to, f you know, form the most accurate guess of what the ideas are in your mind. Um, you know, I mean, this can be compared by, to some of Barclay's dialogues. So we didn't read any of Barclay's dialogues, but in di Barclay's dialogues, there's always a character who clearly represents Barclay. <laughs> and the Barclay character convinces the other character that Barclay is right. But this dialogue is just not like that. So it's not clear in the end. Um whether and how we're supposed to conclude from this book what Hume thinks or whether it has some other purpose. Now, you know, what other purpose might it have? Well, so another thing that the dialogue is sort of announced to be about before, I mean, not in the title and not by Pamphilus in his letter, but in part one, there's a kind of announced or discussion between Cleanthes, Philo, and Demia that indicates that the dialogue might really be about education, or at least that that's what's on their mind. And it's on their mind because Pamphilus is there, and this is how it originally comes up. This is why it would have maybe been good to read part one. But the way the subject originally comes up is that Demia says, you know, Cleanthes, I've always admired the great care you took in the education of your friend's son, Pamphilus, here. And I wanted your opinion about a certain principle that I follow in educating my children. Or he probably says educating my sons, actually. What should he say? He says, my own children. Interesting. He doesn't say sons. Okay. Anyway, so this is in part one, and again, not part of the assigned reading, but I'm going to read it on page three. The method I follow in their education is founded on the saying of an ancient, that students of philosophy ought first to learn logics, then ethics. Right? We, do, we say logic why we, we, ch we ended up with a singular form for logic and the plural for ethics and physics. I'm not sure, but anyway. Uh, first to learn logics, then ethics, next physics, last of all, the nature of the gods. It says here in a footnote who this is a quote from, but anyway, it doesn't, it's a quote from an ancient Stoic. Yes. Um, uh, but uh, a lot of other people said the same thing, both in ancient and medieval times. This is the order um, of study. Why? Because um, this science of natural theology, according to him being the most profound and abstruse of any, required the maturest judgment in students, and none but a mind enriched with all the other sciences can safely be entrusted with it. Right, so the issue here is danger. It's not just that they won't understand it without this preface of logic, ethics, and physics. It's that um, if they start studying theology without this preface of logic, ethics, and physics, um, they can easily be led astray into dangerously wrong opinions about the nature of, well, the nature of the gods is what Demia's authority says, but of course Demia would say the nature of God. Um, so we have to make sure that they have a good foundation in logic, ethics, and physics first before they start on this dangerous topic of theology. 
and you know, um, so we know from this that, uh, and and then Philo and Cleanthes start talking about whether this is a good idea or not. Um, so uh, we know from this that Demia doesn't think you should necessarily discuss theology in front of a young person who's just starting their education. Now, again, I don't know exactly how old Pamphilus is, but I know that Demia doesn't forget this. And since Demia doesn't forget it, that means Hume doesn't forget it, right? In other words, um, if Hume has Demia bring it up much later, after the reader may have lost track of it, that means that Hume was thinking about it the whole time. So, uh, right, so this is on page 17 in part two. Good God, cried Demia, interrupting him. Where are we? Zealous defenders of religion. So here Demia is assuming, and this is what they all kind of agreed on at the end of part one. Of course, we're all, none of us are atheists. We're all here to defend religion. We just want to discuss the nature of the deity or something. So Demia says, good God. Where are we? Zealous defenders of religion allow that the proofs of, de of a deity fall short of perfect evidence? And you, Philo, on whose assistance I depended, blah, 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 blah. Why spare my censure when such principles are advanced, supported by such an authority, by so young a man as Pamphilus? Right, so Demia is... Um, sticking to his principles and is saying, wow, you know, things have gotten out of control just as I was afraid. Cleanthes you're, and Philo, you're now discussing these really dangerous opinions and supporting them with arguments in front of Pamphilus. And Pamphilus is just a young person and can easily be led astray. You shouldn't, if you want to talk about, you know, raise our objections and possibilities and arguments like this, you should do it when Pamphilus is not here. Um, so first of all, this implies, and this is what I said, I was gonna complicate things about Demia a little bit. This implies that Demia, perhaps throughout the whole dialogue, is not saying exactly what he thinks. Right, because Pamphilus is there the whole time. At least throughout the whole point, part of the dialogue, well, Demia is there. At some point, Demia gets angry and leaves. But before that, so, you know, um, Demia, Pamphilus is always there. So Demia has to be watching what he says. So when you say, like, Demia is kind of stupid compared to these two, he doesn't make these complicated, clever arguments like they do. Well, you know... He has a good reason not to, maybe. Um, so, um, so that's one thing we can gather from that. But another thing is that, on the other hand, Hume has put this in a book and published it, and anyone can buy it. So this means that Hume is not worried about this, apparently. I mean, it's true, it was published posthumously. So, uh, there, I mean, there's some kind of story, I don't know the details actually, I should look this up. I think there's some kind of story that actually Hume wanted to publish it in his lifetime, and Adam Smith and or others of his friends convinced him not to because it would be too dangerous. So he put it, you know, he gave instructions for it to be published posthumously. Um, but, uh, um, but, you know, having published, having it published posthumously is not going to reduce the danger to the reader. If there is one, it might reduce the, well, <laughs> eliminate the danger to Hume if he's already dead. Right. But, uh, well, even that's not so clear. Right. I mean, Hume discusses in various places why it is that, um, we desire posthumous fame. Um, I don't think he 
accepts himself from that. So, you know, so, so he could suffer, so to speak, even after his death. But anyway, what we're talking about now is the danger to the reader. So Hume seems like either doesn't care <laughs> about us and our, and our whole society, if, because this kind of theological error could have consequences for everyone, presumably, um, or he thinks that this is safe. But this also further, I mean, from the fact that this comes up again, it raises the possibility that Hume's main point, that that, that ha might be Hume's main point here or something like that. That Hume might really be trying to teach us something about philosophical education in this dialogue. Not necessarily by lecturing us about it, so that we might actually not even realize that he was teaching us something about it. Ray, Ray, again, remember, like Locke's theory is I have a bunch of ideas. I, I, you know, encode them into words, transmit them to you, and you decode them back into ideas. But Barclay's theory is I want to have some effect on you. I figure out what words might have that effect, and I emit those words. <laughs> Right. So, um, uh, so Hume might be trying to teach us something about philosophical education, not necessarily in such a way that we would know that we were being taught that, but just that it would have that effect on us. Um, um, of course, you know, you might think that something along both of those lines would go together. Um, and these topics about education and education and theology, right? Like the charge against Socrates in the Apology is, you know, this is, well, actually, I don't know if we have the text of the actual charge, but this is the reconstruction of what it said. Socrates does injustice by corrupting the young and by not believing in the gods in whom the city believes, but in other daimonia that are novel. Right? That was the charge against Socrates. So it was both that he educates wrong and that he believes in the wrong gods. Um, those two things tend to go together somehow. But in any case, Hume might be, let's say Hume might be at least as interested in teaching us something about philosophical education. Um, this is something I may have first heard from my friend Eric Schließer, who uh, started off as a big Hume, I mean, is still a big Hume expert, I guess, but later moved into Adam Smith and then into other stuff. But um, in any case, um, um, as far as that possible second purpose goes, um, there's a lot of uses possibly for this fictional dialogue situation, right? You can understand better. I mean, again, in the preface, Pamphilus gives certain reasons that are maybe not that convincing why a dialogue about natural religion would be, in, why a treatise about natural religion might be written in dialogue form. But we can definitely understand why a treatise about philosophical education might be written in dialogue form. I mean, there's all kinds of situations where the characters are presenting new theories to each other, and we see how they react to that. And, you know, they at least can get some feeling about what might be a better reaction and what might be a worse reaction. At least um, the characters, you know, think about that, right? So like here, Sorry, again, this is uh, in part one, so it wasn't part of the assigned reading, but I'm going to read it anyway. Um, wait, where is this? Oh, no, no, sorry. This is page 41, not page 4. Okay. So it's in part 6. Okay. Yeah. Um, Philo comes up with a weird new theory. 
Um, I forget which weird new theory this is. He, Philo has like a hundred of them. Anyway, Cleanthes says, This theory I own has never before occurred to me, though a pretty natural one. And I cannot readily, upon so short an examination, upon so short an examination and reflection, deliver any opinion with regard to it. And Philo says, "You are very scrupulous indeed. Were I to examine any system of yours, I should not have acted with half that caution and reserve in starting objections and difficulties to it. However, if anything occur to you, you will oblige us by proposing it." So it's not like. It's not like that little dialogue settles which Hume thinks is better or, you know, which Hume thinks is a better way of teaching and a better way of being taught um, or of responding to something someone is trying to convey to you um, because the characters disagree about that just like they disagree about theology, right? And we saw that already when I said that the, the, the book begins with them all disagreeing about how you should educate your children. Um, so um, it's still going to be hard to pin Hume down for what he's doing, but on the other hand, it does seem like he might be doing something about that. All right. Um, I'll probably come back to this this again next time, but now I want to get into the, the details of what the characters are supposedly arguing about because they're complicated and interesting. Unless, are there any questions about what I've been talking about so far? Okay. Um, So we're talking about, first of all, we're talking about natural religion, right? Natural religion is as opposed to revealed religion. So this is what you could figure out about um, There's actually something a little weird about this. You might, you know, it would be clearer if instead of natural religion, it said natural theology. Right? Natural theology is what you can figure out about the nature, if any, of God using your own reason without having to have God tell you something. Um, um, and that is what they appear to be discussing for most of the book. Natural religion would bring in different issues. At least I would think the way I would use the term religion. Um, like, so how should you act in light of this? You know, like, so should this being be worshipped? And if so, how? Or should this being's will be obeyed? And if so, how do we know what its will is? Um, that is more of a practical than a, than a theoretical question. But in any case, uh, maybe, I don't know, actually, that might be important when we get to the end of the book. But for now, let's just say natural religion means natural theology. They're discussing what you can find out about God using human reason alone. Um, so... Uh, you know, um, in the background is the idea that uh, obviously, you know, now that we have revelation, we don't need this so much, right? Because we can rely on revelation to learn about God. Um, um, and that, roughly speaking, is what Hume says in that footnote at the end. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think we've already seen enough just in Locke, you know, uh, to realize how problematic that is going to be. Um, like as if someone gives you a book and says, someone told me 
that someone told them, that someone told them, that someone told them, that someone wrote this, and he said God told him to write it. That's revelation, right? And on the other hand, you have your own reason. So, uh, um, when you put it that way, of course, it's going to look like natural religion better go pretty far or else revelation isn't going to get you anything. Uh, it, it definitely provides a cover for discussing all kinds of weird views because you can, like, I mean, it's kind of a thin cover, but anyway, you can kind of claim that, well, but I, this is, I mean, this is what unaided human reason would arrive at. Of course, you know, Christians believe something else because of revelation. All right. Anyway, I probably spent more time than that I should have. That's the meaning of the title of the book. <laughs> That's what they're talking about. But they narrow down the question um, on page 13, the beginning of part two. Oops. Scan. Yeah. Page thirteen, the beginning of part two. The question is not concerning, this is Demia speaking, the question is not concerning the being, but the nature of God. Right? So in part one, Philo and Cleanthes started to discuss a little bit the arguments for the existence of God against atheism. And Demia breaks in and says, but, oh, come on, no, one's, no one in their right mind is an atheist. Uh, clear, it's not worth wasting our time talking about that. What we really should be talking about is the nature of God, right? So there's two questions, you know. Does God exist and what is the nature of God? Um, and... Uh, Demia says the answer to this one is obviously yes, so we don't even need to discuss it anymore. Right? Check that off. What about this one? And Demia says the answer to that one is we don't know, it's incomprehensible. Now, I mean, uh, maybe it, I don't know if it would surprise you or not, or if it surprised you or not when you read this, to see the spokesperson for orthodoxy um, maintaining this view that the nature of God is incomprehensible and we can't say anything about it. Well, I mean, actually, Demius does say we can say that God exists. He doesn't seem to have problems attributing the predicate of being to God in uh, the same sense that it applies to creatures. Um, so that actually makes him something of a moderate by standards of traditional theology, right? In the, in the Middle Ages, it was a... Um, um, And in ancient times too, if you late antiquity, if you count the Neoplatonists and whatever, there was um, there was a big question about whether uh, even exists literally could apply to God, or whether God is so much different than us that existence means something else, and we don't know what <laughs> when it comes to God, right? So. Um, uh, so, but anyway, as far as everything else goes, uh, Demia is actually on pretty solid ground. 
this is the traditional view. Now, what I mean by traditional, it's the traditional view of kind of um, Aristotelian slash Neoplatonic uh, religion, starting with the ancient Neoplatonists, then, you know, moving ahead to more philosophical uh, Christians, Muslims, and Jews, and then Christians again, <laughs> sort of, <laughs> um, throughout the Middle Ages, right? So, uh, you know, the view is that God is infinitely perfect and that there's no analogy between divine perfection and the perfection of created things. Um, so, um, but, you know, you might think actually before giving, well, even, let's say this, this is weird, right, to say I know something exists, but it's totally incomprehensible to me what it is, but in a way, it's even weirder, or no, maybe this is weirder, but it's already weird to say, all right, we know it, God exists. The question is, what is the nature of God? What do you mean we know God exists? We know what exists. You know, like if I say, I know a burble exists, I haven't really told you anything unless I can tell you what a burble is, presumably. <laughs> so, um, um, So the answer apparently must be, and this also goes some way towards explaining what Demia's position is, um, that we don't have any um, absolute definition of God. We only have a relative definition. Right? Remember, relative and absolute are opposites. So we can't say, this is the same thing that Locke said about substance. We can't say what substance is. All we can say is how it's related to the qualities, the sensible qualities. It supports them or something like that. So, um, um, so apparently the characters are working with a relative definition of God is the thing that's, let's say, related to the world in a certain way. And then the question is, can we know anything about what that is in itself, right? Its own intrinsic nature um, or not. And if we can, what can we know about it? So I think that's true. Except the problem is the three characters are not working with the same relative definition. And this is what part of what makes the argument confusing for them and for us. Um, so, you know, it's hard to say, what is God? And again, what is God is not the same question as what is the nature of God, because we're going to give it a relative answer. So we don't have to know what it is. We just have to know how it's related to something else. And I think, you know, for Demia, this gets back to the difference between religion and theology, or the relationship between them. I think, for Demia, God is the proper object of worship. So if you prove that something exists, but that thing is not worthy of worship in organized religion, then what you've proved is to exist is not God. Now, to me, it doesn't say that explicitly anywhere. And, you know, um, perhaps either doesn't completely, isn't completely clear about that with himself that's on the stupid Demia hypothesis, 
or actually doesn't want to bring that out on the smarter Demia hypothesis before Pamphilus. Um, but uh, that's Demia. Cleanthes. No, maybe I should say Philo first, because Cleanthes is the most complicated. According to Philo, God is the first cause. So, um, in fact, this is the one I can be most sure about because Philo actually states this definition on page 14. Um, near the beginning of part two. So it's part of an argument. This is the argument, this is how Philo is going to agree, but Philo's agreement with Demia is a trick all along, in case that's not clear. It will become clear to everyone, including Demia, in the next part. But anyway, um, so his, as part of his agreement with Demia, he says, yeah, of course, it's obvious that God exists, and this is the proof. Nothing exists without a cause. And the original cause of this universe, whatever it be, we call God, and piously ascribe to him every species of perfection. Right? So this universe, meaning everything, exists. It must have a cause. You know, I mean, of course, individual things have individual causes. We can trace them from one cause to another. But everything all put together must have a cause. That's the first or original co or universal cause of everything. And Philo says that's what we call God. So according to Philo, if we prove that something exists and that thing, let's say, is not worthy of worship, but is the first cause of, universal cause of everything, then that thing is God, and we've proved that God exists. On the other hand, according to Philo, if we've proved that something exists and that thing is worthy of worship, um, but it doesn't explain everything, it's not the universal, all-sufficient cause of everything, then it's not God. It's just some really good thing, right? You might call it a God, which uh, at one point Philo does go into some polytheistic hypotheses, but you wouldn't call it God, according to Philo. Yeah, and so again, right, again, notice that this is a relative definition. These are both relative definitions. They say, this says how religion is related to Basically. This says how the world or the universe, everything is related to this. Whereas um, so I'm not sure what's the right way to put this. I mean the the simplest way to put this is would be to say that Cleanthes thinks that God is um, reason and will as cause of the material world. Maybe, well, maybe I should say as cause of, the, of our world or something like that. Because it's not necessarily bodies as exposed to spirits. I mean, the reason I'm hesitating about this is because this part seems to go over into this, nature, right? The nature of God. God has a reason and a will. I mean, that is what Cleanthes is looking for, but that can't really be part of uh, a purely relative definition. So, um, I just thought of this. So 
So one way of reconciling this would be to say that Cleanthes never really admits to this move here. Cleanthes really thinks we need to settle that a certain kind of thing exists. And then until we can do that, this is meaningless, which would fit Cleanthes' argument to a certain extent. Maybe that's what he means. So he doesn't have a purely relative definition. Um, so he's agreeing to Demia and Philo's demand that they discuss the nature of God rather than the existence of God. This is a kind of Socratic move. Um, but all the while, he knows that um, as far as he's concerned, you have to settle the nature first before you can go on to settle the existence. This actually, it's not just kind of a Socratic move. It's very parallel to what Socrates does at one point in the Mino. Um, which is also about education. Hmm. Well, anyway, be that as it may. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's one solution to this. You know, I just, I w I just want to say again, like, um, if you're wondering how you can say something original, and by original not meaning that you know for sure that no one else has ever said it. I mean, I kind of doubt that what I'm saying right now is something no one else has ever said. Uh, but uh, original meaning is your idea, not someone else's idea. So how you can say something original about this book and not just summarize it. Well, just look, it's so, first of all, like all of this, none of this would be included in a summary exactly, right? All of that was like thinking about, okay, what could they mean here? They, you know, they asked this question, but it, First, they already proved that the, that the thing exists. Now they're going to ask the nature of it. How could that be reasonable? They must be thinking. And then I found Philo actually saying it. So I'm like, okay, Philo definitely is thinking that. And then I thought, thought yeah, I guess all three of them are. But now, just now, it's like, well, actually, maybe Cleanthes isn't. Like, all of that is, you know, I mean, there's a lot of points to be made about what's going on in the book. And also, I just did all of that without trying to figure out what Hume thinks about the existence of God. Or whether Hume agrees with one of these characters or the other. Because, and, and yet it does tell you something about Hume. Right? I mean, it shows you that Hume is thinking about this issue, that he, you know... At least if I'm right, it should, I'm, I'm claiming that Hume is pointing out that there are these three different ways of going. Um, and that is what I'm going to claim. So, right, so, but I, I, like, I didn't, to do that, I didn't have to guess whether Hume thinks one of them is right or whatever. I've already shown, if, I, if I'm right, I've already shown that Hume thinks there's three different possibilities here. And that's interesting. Why is that interesting? Because, of course, traditionally, according to traditional philosophical theology, that same kind of tradition I was talking about before, these three are supposed to, to go together. Right? The, the first cause is supposed to be a reason and will that is the cause of um, our world and is therefore the perfect, the proper object of worship. But as the dialogue goes on, it becomes clear that there may be arguments that prove the existence of one of these things and not the others. That's presumably part of Hume's point. Um, okay, so, um, so for example, this comes to head, to, to a head, um, in part four.
where Philo says, so Cleanthes has offered this elaborate argument that says that, you know, the order, and I guess I should say another way of, you might also say that Cleanthes defines God as the cause of order. Should have said world, world in our world. That would be a completely relative definition. Um, but then Cleanthes tries to show that the cause of order in our world must be a will and reason. That seems to be important to him. Otherwise, he wouldn't count this as natural religion. So, um, so anyway, so he has this elaborate argument that's supposed to show, or it becomes elaborate under Philo's attack anyway, that's supposed to show that the, you know, our world has such order and, um, uh, the parts of it are so well mutually adapted that we can't but believe that it was caused by a reasonable being. Um, to which Philo responds, well, look, by a reasonable being, you mean a being whose ideas are, occur in a certain order and are well adapted to each other. And Philo says, that's just as hard to account for as a material world whose parts have an order and are adapted to each other. Right? It's just like the same complexity replete, repeated in a different medium, so to speak. Right? We had this complex order and adaptation of material things, and what's Cleanthes' explanation for it? Well, there was this, you know, complex order and adaptation of ideas in the mind of a powerful being that caused it. And Philo says, that needs an explanation too. Right? That's no more uh, sort of um, something that would self-evidently exist, that ideal order, than the material order that you're using to explain. So Philo responds, I mean, sorry, Cleanthes responds, um, you start abstruse doubts, cavils, and objections. Cavils? Cavils? Cavils, I think. And objections, that is not a word I usually say. You ask me, what is the cause of this cause? I know not. I care not. That concerns me not. Oops, you can't see what I'm pointing to now. I know not, I care not, that concerns not me. I have found a deity. And here I stop my inquiry. So you can see why they reach this disagreement because according to Philo, if you've arrived at something that still needs to be explained, you have not found a deity. Whereas according to Cleanthes, since he's found this reasonable, good cause of the order that we find in our world. And now you understand why I wrote our world, right? Meaning the world of our experience, the world of material things. And if they're like, if they have immaterial spirits, I guess those two, right? But the world of our experience that, you know, contains this order and adaptation, that's what we want to account for. Once we've accounted for that, we're done. So Cleanthes, Cleanthes says, I have found a deity, but Philo obviously will say, no, you haven't. And on the other hand, Philo, and this is part of just another round of this, an earlier round of the same argument, basically, earlier in part four. Um, if the material world rests upon a similar ideal world, this ideal world must rest upon some other, and so on without end. It were better, therefore, never to look beyond the present material world. Oh, so actually, Philo does call it the material world, but still, I think that's not exact. 
by supposing it to contain the by supposing it to contain the principle of its order within itself, we really assert it to be God. And the sooner we arrive at that divine being, so much the better. Right? So what Philo is saying here is, again, this is his argument against Cleanthes. Uh, where can I feel this? I guess I'll erase some of this stuff at the top. The argument against Cleanthes, Cleanthes says, here's our material world, and it's all got this intricate order. <laughs> no, I'm using the lines and stuff. All right. So Cleanthes says, but where did that order come from? It must have come from somewhere else. It must have come, and he has an argument why it must have come from this. It must have come from the order of ideas in a mind, right? So, you know, it's the same, maybe not exactly the same order, but anyway, there's some complicated order of ideas in this mind, and that's what allows this ideal world to give rise to this material world that we see. So Cleanthes says, look, I mean, sorry, Philo says, look, if you think that um, order needs to be explained wherever you find it, then you're going to have to invent another ideal world to explain this one, because it has order in it. But on the other hand, if you think that sometimes order doesn't have to be explained, and you can just say, oh, it has its own order inherent in it, then why not just stop with the material world and say it has its own order in it. Now, so far, so good, but, but like, this is where the, the disagreement about the definition comes in. Philo says, and in that case, this would be God. That is, the world as a whole would be God. Now, that's true according to Philo's definition, right? That is, if the world as a whole completely accounts for itself, then it is God. It's the first cause. But on the other hand, from Cleanthes' point of view, it's not. Right? Because it's just a, um, at least on the hypothesis Philo is giving now, it's just like a unthinking machine. Um, and presumably... Demia, presumably, I mean, unless Demia agrees with some of the ancient Stoics. And remember, Demia started out by quoting an ancient Stoic authority. <laughs> um, but Demia presumably thinks that this would not be the proper object of worship either. Um, Could it come apart some another way for Demia? Maybe. Again, if this is true, Demia won't say it. Um, Demia might think that we really can't say anything about God except that it's proper to worship God. In other words, that the real issue here is about the necessity of religion for human society. And it has nothing to do with the existence of some incomprehensible thing. Or we can say, yes, it has to do with the existence of something. We know not what. <laughs> and it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, now, I mean, that's interesting because it's after Demia leaves that Philo and Cleanthes begin discussing the question of whether religion is good for society or not, as we'll see. Um, all right. In any case, um, so far, this was all kind of a big, I said I was going to get into the details of the arguments, but I haven't yet, right? This is all kind of an introduction to how, what they're even arguing about. And it turns out that part of the problem is that they're not necessarily arguing about the same thing. <laughs> um, okay, but still, I can describe how the discussion goes. I, already, I guess I already started to do that somewhat, but now let me try to do it more systematically. 
Oops, unless there are questions about what I just erased. It would have been easier to ask the question before I erased it. Questions? Okay, so let me go back to the, their initial agreement that the divine nature is utterly incomprehensible. That is, so the initial agreement would be Philo and Demia. So Philo and Demia agree that the divine nature is incomprehensible. Later on, Cleanthes calls this mysticism. But Demia objects to that as a, says that that's a pejorative term. Oops. I, I don't think it's that, you know, I mean, there are and have been plenty of people who self-apply that name, but in any case, uh, Demia does not like it. Um, I guess it's supposed to sound su superstitious, um, perhaps Catholic, although there were plenty of Anglican mystics, so I don't know. But in any case, um, um, perhaps it's supposed to sound Jewish, actually. Because a lot of these people were into Kabbalah, but anyway, be that as it may. Um, so uh, mysticism is Cleanthes' term for it. But as Philo and Demia rightly point out, their and as I was pointing out before, their position is pretty traditional. And in fact, when Cleanthes goes on to say, you mystics are no better than atheists, um, I, I think it's actually Philo who says, you know, Consider who you're charging with atheism, Cleanthes. Practically every sound uh, orthodox theologian ever. Um, so they agree that the divine nature is incomprehensible. And yet, and there's, of course, a little bit of a seeming, or a lot of a seeming inconsistency here. They also admit they also agree that certain um, attributes, certain things are, are to be, certain predicates are to be attributed of God, or to be attributed of God. Um, and one of them is simplicity. Um, another one is infinity. Another one is perfection. Um, another one is unity. There's only one God. Eternity. And immutability. that is not changing, not subject to change. Now, um, this whole list of attributes is indeed traditional. Again, it goes back at least to ancient Neoplatonism and then in uh, early Christianity and, um, and then in the Middle Ages, at least some people in uh, uh, all three Western religions. So, um, um, so they're on, you know, they're on solid ground in saying this. How can this be reconciled with their saying that the divine nature is incomprehensible? Well, I mean, first of all, um,
Actually, no, I shouldn't say that. So, um, so with respect to some attributes, like reason, right? Like, I remember I said that traditionally you would think that the first cause was also a supreme reason. Oh, what is under eternity? Immutability. Right? Again, not being subject to change. So, you know, so with respect to reason uh, or and attributes like that, wisdom, uh, um, benevolence, other attributes like that, the, a traditional response would be, and Philo says this pretty early on, that we uh, we honor God by using predicates, applying to God predicates that mean good things when they're applied to us, even though they couldn't possibly mean the same thing when we apply them to God. So that's part of the answer. Um, but um, beyond that, there's another answer, which is that certain predicates can be said to apply literally to God, even though God's nature is incomprehensible, because they're negative. Right? So, like, simplicity just says God is not composite. Infinity just says God is not limited. Perfection might be a little harder, but you could say it just means God is not imperfect, which is another kind of limitation, let's say. Unity... Eternity, eternity is usually taken to mean God is not in time, right? Like not God always exists, but God is not um, temporal determinations don't apply to God. And immutability obviously is negative, right? So all of these things are something you could say about something without knowing what it is. Just... You're just excluding what it isn't. Namely, it isn't like any of the other things, the created things that we know about. Um, um, so, like, why do they insist so much on these attributes? And um, so, you know, one reason is that they're traditional. That's especially probably the strongest reason for Demia who's trying to be orthodox, um, at least in front of Pamphilus. And, um, but beyond that, these attributes are connected with each other and with certain argu traditional arguments. So they're not just arbitrary. Um, they're, uh, you know, important parts of the view that especially Philo um, tries to develop systematically near the beginning before he starts just attacking Cleanthes. And, um, um, you know, so, like, just for example, to see where this simplicity thing comes from, just think about that argument I was describing before between Philo and Cleanthes. Like, as, lo as, as long as something is still composite, um, there's or as long, whenever something is composite, there's something to be explained about it. What put the pieces together in that way? Why are they that composed in that order, etc.? So, at least this is the way traditional types of arguments will go. That thing couldn't be the first cause. Right? A composite thing couldn't be the first cause. Now, we know that in the end, Philo doesn't stick with that, right? Because, and that's, I guess, maybe you say an early indica indication that Philo is not really on Demia's side. But, because in the end, Philo says, well, no, actually, maybe the whole world is, is the first cause. If, at least, I mean, at that point, he says, if, you know, we admit that order could be explained itself. Maybe, I guess he could say that that's a reductio ad absurdum. But of course, order can't explain itself. But anyway, um, 
So, right, so the argument is that something that's composite couldn't be the first cause. So if you want these things to go together in the right way, then you have to, and that's just an example that you can kind of, the other ones either somehow are supposed to require each other or also, you, and or you can make arguments like the ones I just made. Right, like so for example, perfection is supposed to imply immutability because uh, I mean, there's also arguments from simplicity, immutability, but perfection is supposed to imply immutability because um, like the at least Aristotelian, but also uh, a lot of early moderns like Spinoza and Leibniz have the same understanding. Understanding of what causes change or what change even is, is that um, you know, things tend towards a more perfect state. So if something's already perfect, there's nowhere left for it to go. So it can't change. Or I guess to put it a different way, you could say, maybe this is a better version of the argument. If the thing can change, then um, either it's not perfect yet, then it's not perfect. Or it is perfect, which means it can only change for the worse, assuming there's only one way to be perfect. It's, I mean, that is an assumption that usually goes in here. Uh, Descartes argues for that, other people argue for it. Anyway, assuming there's only one way to be perfect, if, if it's already perfect, it can only change for the worse. But being able to change for the worse is itself an imperfection. Right? It's not as good as not being able to change for the worse. So again, we would see that um, um, perfection implies immutability. Um, but um, on the other hand, all these attributes taken together imply that whether divine nature is absolutely incomprehensible or not, it must be really, really different from our nature. Right? We are not simple. I mean, obviously our bodies are not simple. They're obviously composite. But as Philo points out, our mind seems to be composite in some way as well. Um, maybe not exactly the same way, but it's certainly not absolutely simple. And it's certainly not immutable. Um, you know, we're not infinite. We're not perfect. Descartes proves that he's not perfect because he um, is able to doubt, which means there's something he wishes he knew but he doesn't know. <laughs> that shows he couldn't be perfect. Um, there's more than one of us, we're not eternal, we're not immutable, etc. So God must be, and we're not close to any of these things, right, so to speak. I mean, in a, in a way, you can't be close to these. These are absolute, right? But anyway, we're not anything like this. So God must be really, really different from us. Um... Right, so both Demia quotes Malbranche, who's a, um, a follower of Descartes, an important rationalist philosopher, um, but one who didn't make the big three for whatever reason. Um, uh, Demia quotes Malbranche saying this. Philo says it in his own words. Um, let me read Philo's version, not both. Philo says on page 14, near the beginning of part two, um, as all perfection is entirely relative, we ought never to imagine, I guess he means as all finite perfection is entirely relative. Hmm. 
Maybe not. Anyway, but as all perfection is entirely relative, we ought never to imagine that we comprehend the attributes of this divine being, or to suppose that his perfections have any analogy or likeness to the perfections of a human creature. Wisdom, thought, design, knowledge, these we justly ascribe to him. This is what I was talking about before. These we justly ascribe to him because these words are honorable among men. And we have no other language or other conceptions by which we can express our adoration of him. But let us beware lest we think that our ideas any wise correspond to his perfections or that his attributes have any resemblance to these qualities among men. Right? So according to this view, not only is God not a big... And again, this is the orthodox view. That's what you have to realize. So according to this view, not only is God not like a big person in the sky with a long white beard, right? That's called anthropomorphism, the view that, that God literally has a human figure. Um, of course, Jews and Muslims will often say that that's exactly what Christians believe. <laughs> they worship some, some guy, <laughs> you know? Jesus of Nazareth. Well, but anyway, leaving that aside, so uh, um, anthropomorphites say that, because I guess I shouldn't leave that quite aside. Obviously, Christians, uh, at least Orthodox Christians, as opposed to anthropomorphists, will not agree to that description of what it is they worship. You know, Christ has a divine nature and a human nature, and it's very, very complicated, but it's not at all true that God has the form of a human body. All right, so anyway, be that as it may, so um, but so not only are they denying that, but they're denying that God um, uh, wants things, thinks things, uh, certainly that God gets angry, is sad, um, right? All those things contradict one or the other of these attributes. They involve changes, they involve complexity, a composition, right? Um, so the orthodox view, and this is why I trace it more back to ancient Neoplatonism, and ultimately, I guess I'd say to Plato and Aristotle, than let's say to the Bible, is because, um, getting back to the question of how to interpret the Bible again, you would not think this when you read it. It would not occur to you, certainly not the Old Testament, but I don't think the New Testament either. I'm not, I, for obvious reasons, I'm not quite as familiar with the New Testament, but uh, um, uh, certainly if you read the Old Testament, it would not occur to you in a million years that the God who's being described here has this kind of attributes. Once you believe that, you can go back and read it that way. That's for sure. Right? I mean, and there's texts you can use and whatever. But if all you had was that, I mean, from the beginning, God is thinking stuff, willing stuff, right? Before the flood, it says that God regretted, regretted that he created human beings, and that's why he decided to destroy them. Um, it's not this kind of being. It's a being, uh, on the contrary, that seems quite similar to human beings, stronger for sure perhaps better, at least by some definition of better, <laughs> although kind of bloodthirsty in some ways as well, but, uh, um, but not absolutely simple, etc. Um, so anyway, all of this is what Philo and Demia are defending. And on the other side, we have Cleanthes, who makes... Oh boy, I only have five minutes left. All right. <laughs> why, why can't I learn to, to manage this better? You're probably like, yeah, why can't you learn to manage this better? <laughs> Aren't we paying you for something? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, uh, Cleanthes has this argument from design. And, you know... Part of the reason for this big buildup, although it probably doesn't entirely justify it, is that, um, like, if you read contemporary analytic philosophy of religion, as it's co is called, um, 
Oh, or even more so if you just had some kind of vague ideas about what philosophers and other people might say about God, you might really think that Cleanthes is obviously the orthodox one, right? Because what Cleanthes, Cleanthes' whole argument is, it's an argument by analogy. And Cleanthes says, um, the, the world very much resembles an artifact, like a house or a ship or a watch. Um, watch, obviously, is the, the big early modern metaphor that they didn't really have in ancient times, right? In ancient times, tools were mostly things that you had to keep doing stuff with or else they were inert. But a watch is something that you can just wind up and then it's a tool that does stuff for itself. Anyway, so um, uh, the, the world very much resembles something like that. We, our whole experience is that things like that are caused by rational beings. Um, the world resembles them, except the world is much bigger and more complicated than any of them. So it resembles a really, really big, complicated watch or ship or house. So we should conclude that a very powerful and wise rational being is the cause of the existence of the world. And when Philo and Demia press him and say, wait, but that won't prove simplicity, infinity, perfection, etc. On the contrary, that will prove that God is more like us, right? We don't find that watches and ships and houses are caused by simple, perfect, infinite beings. We find that they're caused by mutable beings with emotions and changing thoughts and, you know, who have to figure things out, sometimes make mistakes maybe. When Philo and Demia press Cleanthes on that, he says, yeah. Yeah, I don't think, I don't believe in these attributes. In fact, Cleanthes says, these attributes make God into something incomprehensible and irrelevant. And you might as well say nothing. And actually, if you remember, this is one of the arguments in Berkeley about matter. If you add up a whole bunch of negative attributes, Right? Translate these all into not composite, not finite, not imperfect, etc., etc., etc. That certainly agrees with the definition of nothing. That's one thing that's comprehensible that has all those attributes. Right? So it's not that surprising that Cleanthes turns around. From this like intellectual point of view, it's not that surprising that Cleanthes turns around and says, no, you guys are the atheists. My less than perfect God who, by the way, we can't be absolutely sure exists because an argument by analogy is not like a demonstrative proof in first principles. It's an argument from experience. So Cleanthes says, you know, my kind of imperfect and somewhat uncertain to exist God is a God, whereas yours is nothing. <laughs> you guys are the atheists. You mystics are the atheists. Okay, I, I, hopefully I'll have time next time to say something about how Philo and Demia respond to that. But uh, I think I did get to probably the most important point about what's going on. And I will see you one last time on Thursday. Bye.